These are my nieces, Liza and Ellie. They are five and three, respectively. This is me. This is me playing with my nieces. This is me playing with my nieces, except I am exhausted when the photo is taken. My sister has a lot of these photos. Each picture has its own story, but one thing remains the same. Every single one of them was taken inside. Liza and Ellie like to play outside in short bursts, but they quickly get bored and want to return inside. This is a far cry from my own childhood, which was rife with adventures and exploration of the outdoors. I wanted to change that. I began this project with a single goal, get my nieces to play outside more. More specifically, get them to want to play outside. If I can create a system of play which encourages them to play outside, then it is likely that the same system will work for other children as well. My name is David Fennerin, and I am going to create a safe, outdoor system of play to encourage creativity in children through both solo and tandem constructive play. Throughout the course of this presentation, I'll take you through my entire design process, starting with research, moving to design guidelines, then design process, and concluding by showing the final solution, then looping back to my guidelines to see if I succeeded. Through the course of my research, I tried to get information from as many fields relating to my project as I could. I kept in communication with designers and manufacturers of children's play equipment through email, conducted a survey for families with young children, searched the competitive market to see what was done well and where there was room for improvement, and later on in the project, I received multiple rounds of feedback from focus groups of young mothers in my designs. Before I even started my project in earnest, I was able to get in contact with Drew Brandt, who at the time was a designer for KidCraft and helped create outdoor playsets for their brand. Through a series of phone calls, I described to him my general desire to make an outdoor system of play. Among other insights, he instructed me to thoughtfully consider safety as one of the primary factors. He said that in his field, safety is a big barrier for creativity, especially in large playground equipment. So I had to ensure that whatever I created was sturdy and safe in any advertised configuration. This prompted me to dive deeply into legal and safety requirements for toys and playsets, and I ensured that both material and mechanical safety was top of mind throughout the entire design process. The Playtime Activities Questionnaire was a primary source of information for this project. I curated a set of several open-ended questions and sent it to families of young children in order to discover how children naturally play and what the desires of both the child and the parent would be. With over 30 families responding, I had over 300 unique answers to sort through. Through the process of sifting through the answers, patterns began to emerge. I was able to find out a lot of the features that parents thought were necessary, and which attributes they valued most. I found repetition among the answers, and we find down the list to which ones were the most important to both the child and the parent. This included creativity, imagination, and the ability to play make-believe to encourage mental and social development, sharing and cooperation to encourage empathy and listening to others, and safety in the toys and products that they were playing with. There are several current solutions on the market in terms of outdoor children's playsets, and so I searched the competitive market to see what was done well and where there was room for improvement. One such product is one which I have a personal interest in, the classic castle from Little Tykes. Although I never owned one myself, when I was young I would visit a friend of mine who did. I distinctly remember loving that castle and the stories we would tell from inside of it, for about a week. After that, it sat unattended in her backyard until her parents finally threw it away. This got me thinking of other similar play sets, such as modern houses and small slides. Each of them act as a setting for playtime and stories that young children can tell, but fall short by not allowing children to create their own imaginative space, and thus get left by the wayside once the kids explore all they have to offer. In order to inspire creativity and imagination, I wanted my product to combine the best aspects of these playsets, while being buildable and rebuildable by the children themselves. Using the information I gleaned from research, I created a set of guidelines for my designs, which would need to be completed in order for my project to be successful. They are, in order, safe, fun, and market-ready. 
In order for my product to be safe, it has to comply with all legal safety compliance requirements of the United States, as well as pass judgment from actual parents of young children. It has to be obviously and actually safe. In order to encourage fun for the children who play with it, my product must spark creativity and imagination, support sharing and cooperation, and foster independence and autonomy. Kids should want to play with it and have a good time doing so. As a final stretch goal, I wanted to propose not only a product, but a market-ready brand, one that can actually be produced in the real world and that can be easily marketable and saleable. With the bulk of my research behind me and my guidelines set, I jumped into the largest part of the project, design. The actual process of designing Gulliver Blocks was a three-phase operation, concept, elaboration, and tuning. In the concept phase, I took all of my research and figured out the precise scope of the project. This phase consisted almost entirely of digital sketching as I tried to work into an idea that I liked. I kept in contact with two professional industrial designers, Drew Brandt and Nicole Norris, who agreed to help me with my project as I sent them my design drafts, and they offered feedback for me to incorporate into later revisions. At the end of this phase, the scope of the project was narrowed to a set of modular panels that could be reconfigured into different play areas. I moved into the next phase with three specific concepts that I wanted to explore. The elaboration phase was the longest portion of the project, wherein I moved from general concepts to specific mechanics. I started by using foam and paper to create prototypes of different types of panel connectors, and decide which was the most effective. This also allowed me to visualize proportions, connections, and how the whole line of products would fit together. I finally settled on this design, which I lovingly refer to as the castle wall. Its advantages are a unique visual style combined with a simple connection system that works with gravity rather than against it. It allows for multiple panels to connect in a line, and for multiple floors to be built on top of one another. After prototyping, I was able to take the designs and move into a 3D modeling program called SolidWorks. Continuing to move from general to specific, 3D modeling allowed me to create and customize the exact shape and features on each panel. My initial designs were sharp, had no rounded corners, and were almost twice as large as they are now, causing them to be incredibly heavy, almost 20 pounds per panel. This wasn't going to fly. I had to slowly whittle down the dimensions and proportions until I got to a size that fit children, while still allowing them to safely handle it. I compared my models to the proportions of actual children to ensure that the sizing would be appropriate. At the end of this phase, I had a complete batch of 3D models for all the panels, as well as a series of assemblies, where the panels came together to form a specific set. I also had documentation to prove that these panels and assemblies were large enough for the children to play inside of, light enough for them to pick up, and sturdy enough to support their weight. The final phase was tuning, where the design of the product was locked down, and I spent the majority of my time polishing. I took the 3D models from SolidWorks and exported them to Keyshot, which is a program able to simulate materials and light so as to create a photorealistic image of what the product will actually look like. While the designs themselves were finalized, this phase allowed me to make decisions such as color, material, and finish in order to fully complete the visual look of the product line. I spent a lot of time agonizing over color specifically. I wanted to straddle the line between dull but realistic colors and bright and fun but unrealistic colors. I used Keyshot to render out several color variations, only some of which I'm showing here, and worked into a color scheme that I was happy with. In the end, I settled in on a similar route as LEGO, where the colors themselves are fairly saturated, but the palette of each set is more grounded and realistic. At the end of this phase, I had rendered models with the proper colors and materials applied. The design process was long and arduous, but at the end of it all, the design is complete, and we have ourselves a fully realized, functional product. I'd like to introduce you to Gulliver Blocks, a series of simple, safe, Easy to understand panels that link together to create new and interesting play spaces for children in the outdoors. All Gulliver Blocks panels are variations on three basic shapes the exterior wall, the interior wall, and the ceiling panel. The three connect together using simple pin in slot systems, which allow gravity to do most of the work. Allow me to show you. 
Starting with an exterior wall, a second exterior wall can slot directly into the first. An interior wall can be added by placing it in the gap between the two exterior walls. More exterior walls can then be added in the same manner as the first, able to easily fit the interior wall into the process. A ceiling panel can then be added, fully supported by four wall panels. After this are detail pieces, such as half walls, a mast, and a flag. And just like that, a fully constructed pirate ship is ready for the high seas. Gulliver blocks are easy to assemble and play with, and are just the thing a child would need to start a creative adventure outdoors. But before we declare this project a success, let's go back and revisit my initial design guidelines, and compare them against the Gulliver Blocks product line. As a reminder, we wanted this product to be safe, fun, and market ready. So let's break it down. In order for the product to be safe, it has to pass all legal and safety requirements in the United States, as well as pass judgment from actual parents of young children. In order to ensure compliance with national safety requirements, I checked the Gulliver blocks against a standard known as ASTM F963, which, according to Kima, a leading provider of supply chain compliance solutions, is, quote, the standard that covers all toys entering the U.S. market, and has been the model for international standards, end quote. This standard requires products to pass testing in several areas, including mechanical and chemical tests, as well as testing for specific hazards, such as choking, pinching, sharp edges, and enclosed entrapment. Rather than bore you with all the details, I'll show you this safety data sheet that I compiled, and assure you that it complies with all legal requirements. As for material safety, all the panels are made from a single material, low-density polyethylene, or LDPE, which is a recyclable, child-safe plastic, and one of the safest plastics currently on the market. Each panel is created using a process known as rotational molding, or rotomolding, which can create simple, sturdy parts, and is the process by which many playsets today are created. Rotational molding is done by filling a mold with powdered plastic and setting it on a metal arm. This arm and mold are put into an oven where the arm rotates around two axes. As the plastic powder melts, it coats the inside of the mold, creating an airtight, hollow part that, once cooled and removed from the mold, is both light and sturdy. The manufacturing process that I settled on, as well as factors such as material, weight, and wall thickness, were all informed by observations of products currently on the market, including one castle set which I purchased secondhand, drove home strapped on top of a car, set on my porch, and then sawed in half in order to gain a full understanding of its inner workings. Don't worry, I did recycle it afterwards. Finally, in order to ensure that the product passed an intuitive sniff test, I showed Gulliver Blocks to a focus group of mothers of young children. They offered me feedback on my designs over the course of the project, and at the end, they all agreed that they would happily let their children play on it. So Gulliver Blocks are safe, but will kids actually want to play with them? In order to encourage fun for the children who play with it, my product must spark creativity and imagination, support sharing and cooperation, and foster independence and autonomy. Creativity and imagination is built into the DNA of Gulliver Blocks. Each set is promoted as a specific location for a story or an adventure, a classic castle, a pirate ship, or a modern house. But more than that, these blocks are made so that you can reconfigure a set to be whatever you want them to be. A house could become an industrial park, a ship could become an airplane, a castle could become a bigger castle. The only limit to what you can create is your own imagination. In addition, much like other building block toys, the more pieces you have, the more you can build. If you have all three sets, for example, you could build this gigantic fort where everyone can join in on the fun. Built for creativity, these blocks inspire imaginative adventures for all ages. In order to support sharing and cooperation amongst kids playing with Gulliver Blocks, it is imperative that they be designed to sustain multiple children playing at the same time. Each set in its shown orientation has between 12 and 20 square feet of interior play space, including the upper floors. Based on my own experiences playing with my brother, 
as well as observations of my own nieces at play, this is generally enough space to play make-believe in an imagined scenario, and more than enough if you consider the exterior to be part of the play space as well. Each set allows for a solo adventure to be sure, but if you want to bring your friends along for the ride, a cooperative adventure is just within reach. One of the hardest design guidelines to achieve was independence and autonomy. To achieve this, I wanted to ensure that children would be able to assemble and disassemble the playsets by themselves, with minimal assistance, if any. For this, I had to ensure that the kids could actually pick up and maneuver the panels themselves. Although I wasn't able to create the actual pieces to test this, over spring break I cut out some wooden forms with the approximate size and weight of each panel, and much to my delight, some kids from my church were able to pick them up with ease, some even having no trouble lifting them up over their head. Allowing children to build for themselves is a huge milestone, and is the first step in encouraging self-reliance in a child. By sparking creativity and imagination, supporting sharing and cooperation, and fostering independence and autonomy, Gulliver Blocks is able to promote fun in all those who play with them. So the toys are both safe and fun, and ordinarily that would be enough for a decent project, but I wanted to achieve one final stretch goal. I wanted my project to be market ready. That is, given enough funding, it should be able to be produced, marketed, and sold today. For this, I developed the brand of Gulliver Blocks, named after the protagonist from Jonathan Swift's 1726 novel Gulliver's Travels, in which a sailor travels to a variety of exciting new locales and worlds. For this brand, I created a sample business model for how it could be managed, focusing on the movement of products from the manufacturer to the consumer. In order to confirm manufacturability, I reached out to several roto molding manufacturers, including Rising Sun Roto Molding, who were able to look over my designs and give me a price point for how much manufacturing would cost. The quote I was given priced each part around the $27 mark, which would price each set around $250 to $300, which is comparable to other outdoor play sets on the market. This quote does not account for factors such as economies of scale, however, so the price could be reduced further. Gulliver blocks could be marketed and sold in several different ways. The option I have shown in my renderings assumes that the brand would be launched with three distinct sets, with more being released over time, such as a wizard tower or a sports car. Packaging isn't something that I dived too deep into, but here is a potential mock-up for how a Gulliver block set could be packaged and sold. With manufacturable and cost-effective components, marketable sets, means of sale, and packaging options, Gulliver Blocks is a market-ready brand that, given enough funding, could be produced, marketed, and sold today. Gulliver Blocks is a set of safe, fun, market-ready toys that could easily go into production today, and could continue to be a lifelong brand with expansion sets and add-ons. The panels are safe and easy to handle, can be wielded effortlessly by young children, and will encourage creativity, cooperation, and independence, all in an outdoor environment. I started this project with my nieces, Liza and Ellie, in mind. I wanted them to use their imagination and play outside more. Now with Gulliver Blocks, they and every kid like them won't just need to be outside, they'll actively want to be. Thank you so much. <laughs>